Good afternoon and welcome to today's program, the latest installment of In the Armory at the Pritzker Military Museum and Library. The museum and library is open to the public with reduced capacity and social distancing protocols in place. We continue to offer virtual programming in an effort to keep our guests, staff, and constituents safe and healthy. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment to thank our members and donors for their support of the museum and library. We are proud to be a part of your military history exploration. In this webinar format, you can post questions or comments in the Q&A feed and we'll address them as best we can at the end. This program is being recorded and will be available for streaming on our website. I'm Dustin Depew, Director of Museum Collections, and today I'll be discussing the M1 carbine. We'll cover its development, dispel some myths about its origin and performance, and explore its 30-year service history. The M1 carbine is interesting to me as a military firearm for several reasons. First, it's one of those military firearms that you often see in movies, television, and documentaries, but that is still subject to a mythology that obscures the average person's understanding of its place in military and firearms history. Second, it's a bit of an outlier in that it's one of the first successful intermediary long guns in the modern U.S. arsenal. Designed around a cartridge intended to bridge the gap between pistols and full-power rifles, it has been described as the first PDW, or personal defense weapon, a class of firearms designed to be easy to carry, but that still provide enough firepower for decisive defensive action. Lastly, if I were to ask most people, myself included, which firearm was most produced by the U.S. in World War II, I would expect the answer to overwhelmingly be the M1 Garand. This is a perfectly reasonable answer, as the Grand was our nation's standard issue service rifle. But it's wrong. The U.S. made two million more M1 carbines than M1 Garands. And it was made for rear echelon and support soldiers, like engineers and heavy weapon crews. So its very existence highlights the varied roles that citizen soldiers filled during World War II, a subject that the museum and library is dedicated to preserving and sharing. Before we get into the specifics of the M1, let's talk about what a carbine is. It's typically a shorter, lighter version of a primary long gun, be it a rifle or musket. It sacrifices ballistic performance for ease of handling and carrying. Carbines were first developed for cavalry units in the late 16th century as they were easier to handle and fire on horseback. By the mid 19th century, many artillery and other support troops carried carbines instead of full length rifles. This makes sense when you consider that their main role doesn't require them to use their firearm in the same way that a standard infantryman would. So having a short rifle that doesn't get in the way of your primary duty is more important than the advantages that a full-length rifle has in terms of performance. The U.S. Army began adopting carbines shortly before the Civil War and continued to do so through the 19th century. Examples include the Springfield 1847 Muscatoon, the Star Carbine, Sharps Carbine, and the 1892 Krag Carbine, to name a few. Things changed at the start of the 20th century when the Ordnance Corps decided to meld the two concepts together into one rifle. If you watched our episode on the M1903 Springfield, you know that the overall length of that rifle was reduced to eliminate the need for a second, shorter carbine version. The Army didn't use a proper carbine again until World War II. Which brings us to the development of the M1 carbine. In our last episode, we talked about the development of the M1 Garand rifle leading up to World War II. While the Garand was designed, tested, and approved over many years starting in the 1920s, the M1 carbine didn't begin that process until 1941, and it was in production by 1942. That gives you an idea of how quickly the M1 carbine was developed and brought into production. One of the reasons for the late start is that the Ordnance Corps didn't believe there was a need for a firearm to replace the 1911 pistol for rear echelon troops until after World War II started. In 1938, the U.S. Army Infantry Board requested a light rifle to replace the handguns then in use by many support troops. In a letter to the Ordnance Corps, the Chief of the Infantry wrote, quote, Approximately one-fifth of the combat personnel will be serving special weapons or carrying ammunition. These men must be equipped with a light weapon, effective at 300 yards. Infantry board tests prove that pistols and revolvers, even with shoulder holster stocks, 
fail to meet these requirements. The Ordnance Corps ignored this request until after the war started when Germany's blitzkrieg tactics showed that rear echelon troops were more likely to end up in combat than in previous wars. A pistol or revolver is not a very effective or efficient weapon in a combat zone. It's more of a last ditch defensive weapon effective at bad breath distances. Okay, I'm using a little hyperbole, but it takes considerable training and practice to reliably hit targets at 25 yards or more under duress, and a 50 yard maximum effective range is being generous. For comparison, the battle rifles of World War II could be effectively fired up to 300 to 500 yards. Of course, these rifles are actually capable of accurate fire much beyond that, but we're talking about effective range in combat in the hands of the average soldier. Two years later, in 1940, the Ordnance Corps agreed that a new firearm was needed that was as easy to carry as a pistol, but that performed more like a rifle. The design criteria included five main requirements. The light rifle could not exceed five pounds. It had to be effective to 300 yards. It should fire in semi-auto or select fire. It had to be chambered in a new 30 caliber cartridge that was being designed by Winchester. And it had to take detachable box magazines. Less than a year later, in the spring of 1941, nine test models were evaluated by the Ordnance Committee. None of the models tested were accepted, and it was decided to hold a second round of testing in the fall. At the same time, Winchester had been working on a 30 6 rifle that used a gas tappet short stroke system that they felt was promising. The War Department agreed and felt that it could be scaled down to the new, smaller cartridge and submitted to the second round of trials. Winchester had very little time before the second trials and famously designed a prototype in just 13 days. If that's not dramatic enough, their hand-built prototype had reliability issues that would have kept it from competing in the trials were they not fixed by opening the gas port with just hours remaining before the submission deadline. What's more incredible is that their design won the trials and went on to become the M1 carbine. How did they pull this off? Well, here is where the myth and misconception surrounding the development of the M1 carbine begins. This is chiefly due to one Mr. Carbine Williams. Does that sound like someone I just made up? It isn't, and I've got Jimmy Stewart to back me up. Confused? You should be. This is a strange tale, but it's also true. Here's the movie poster. Carbine Williams, the bootlegger, self-taught gunsmith, and convicted murderer who single-handedly built the M1 carbine in two weeks while incarcerated in the Caledonia State Prison in Halifax County, North Carolina. You can't make this up. Except that you can, and people did, mostly. As with many myths, there is a mix of truth and fiction to the story. Let's get it straight. Carbine Williams' name was really David Marshall Williams, and he did lead a pretty interesting life. He was a tinkerer and a bootlegger, and during a raid on his still in 1921, he shot and killed Deputy Sheriff Alfred Jackson Pate. After a hung jury in his first trial, Williams pled guilty to second-degree murder and was sentenced to 30 years hard labor. He was, in fact, a gifted machinist and self-taught gunsmith, and he did work on firearm designs while in prison. In fact, he created two designs, a floating chamber and a short stroke piston system, both of which he later obtained patents for when he got out of prison. His skills as a firearm designer helped fuel the campaign that led to his early release from prison in 1929. He went on to work for Winchester and was eventually brought in to assist with the M1 carbine project, where his short stroke piston design helped in scaling down the larger 30-06 rifle that Winchester was working on to fit within the size and weight restrictions imposed by the Ordnance Corps. Williams wasn't alone, though. He wasn't even in charge. The project was led by Edwin Pugsley, and Williams was just one of many engineers working on the project. By all accounts, Williams' relationship with the Winchester team was tumultuous. In fact, Williams refused to work on the project for much of its short existence, claiming that changes that were made by Pugley's team to his design would result in disaster. Despite this, there is no doubt that Carbine Williams is the most interesting character in this story, and the myth of a prisoner helping the war effort sure sounds cool. So perhaps it's no surprise that Hollywood picked up on that part of the story and ran with it. 
but credit is due to Edwin Pugsley and the rest of the Winchester team for building a reliable firearm in a matter of weeks that served the U.S. for 30 years. Production of the M1 carbine began in the fall of 1942. In total, over 6 million M1 carbines were produced during World War II. That's 2 million more carbines than there were M1 Garands. The carbines were built by 10 different manufacturers with over 2.5 million of them made by Inland Manufacturing Division of General Motors. Other major firms included Winchester, Underwood Elliott Fisher, which made typewriters, and Saginaw Steering Division of General Motors, with each making over 500,000 carbines. Two Chicago companies made M1s, one of which was Rockola Manufacturing Corporation, which made jukeboxes. So many M1s were made that production ceased completely after World War II, and all M1s used in the next 30 years were either surplus or refurbished from the original production run. Before we delve further into the history of the M1 carbine and the cartridge it was chambered for, let's take a closer look at the carbine itself. The M1 carbine had an overall length of 35.6 inches. The standard M1 has wood furniture, an 18-inch barrel, and weighs 5.2 pounds unloaded, and 5.8 pounds with a full magazine. Of the five firearms we've had on this program, the M1 carbine is easily the handiest and lightest of them all. I can easily see how this is a superior firearm for carrying as compared to all of the previous rifles we've looked at. Starting at the buttstock, we see this distinctive cutout. This performs two functions. It holds the bottle of oil used to lubricate the moving parts of the carbine, and it serves as the rear attachment point for the sling. I don't have a sling or oiler to demonstrate this, but the oiler is a small metal tube that fits into the slot, while the sling wraps around it and through to the other side, where it attaches to the front of the stock. You can see that this is where the sling would come through, and it would move and then attach at this point here. The safety on this particular M1 carbine is the later version that is just a turning safety. Earlier safety was a more traditional cross bolt style push safety that you would push in or out. Um, unfortunately, many soldiers got it confused in combat with the magazine release, which we have right here, which is also a push button. I'm gonna demonstrate that now. You push that and the magazine comes right out. So in combat, obviously you can see how that would be an issue if a soldier was accidentally dumping their magazine when they were trying to turn off their safety. So they switched over to this dial. The charging handle has a small button when depressed up at the top here that will lock the action open. Uh, the actions don't generally lock open um, uh, on an empty magazine like some rifles do, like the M1 Grand did. Um, I've heard that the 30 round magazines uh, have a lip on them that will sometimes uh, catch and hold open the bolt, but that over time that wears off and is no longer effective. Um, the 30 round magazine that we have in our collection uh, has been worn down to the point that it also does not hold open the bolt. The bolt in this M1 carbine is the older style bolt that has the top cut out, presumably to reduce weight. This extra cut was dropped early in the production in favor of a rounded top bolt. This carbine also has the bayonet lug seen here at the bottom of the barrel. Early M1s did not have this bayonet lug. This isn't surprising considering the carbine was intended to be carried by troops in supporting roles. The Marine Corps was the biggest proponent of adding the bayonet lug. M1s with the lug weren't available until late in the war, but most M1s were retrofitted with them later. The M4 bayonet was created in 1944 specifically for the M1 carbine. Unlike the M1 Garand, the M1 carbine uses detachable box magazines. The standard magazine that I'm holding here holds 15 rounds of ammunition. With the advent of the Select Fire M2 carbine, a 30 round mag was introduced. To lower the overall profile, the magazine is curved. Still, I've read accounts from soldiers that preferred the 15 round magazines as it allowed them to get closer to the ground when firing from the prone position. In fact, Lieutenant Colonel John B. George, author of Shots Fired in Anger, preferred having the standard magazine cut down even further so that it was flush with the stock, as he felt that the magazine could catch on branches in the thick jungle encountered in the Pacific. In this configuration, the magazine held just six rounds. One of the modern criticisms of the M1 carbine is that it is not a very reliably shooting firearm. 
That may in fact be due to the relatively flimsy nature of these magazines. In his interview with Ian McCollum of the Forgotten Weapons Channel, the legendary Ken Hackathorn discussed that many soldiers in World War II treated the magazines as disposable. This helps circumvent the issue of the magazine being delicate. Modern collectors are more likely to reuse the same magazines repeatedly or use older magazines that are not in the best condition, leading to reliability issues when firing. As a carbine in the US arsenal, the M1 is unique in that it is chambered in a smaller caliber cartridge than the primary service rifle of the time, the M1 Grand. This is largely due to the punishing forces generated by the full power 30-06 cartridges that the Grand fires. It simply wasn't possible to build a compact five pound rifle that could handle it. And even if one could have been developed, the brutal recoil would have made it impossible for rear echelon and support troops to learn to shoot effectively with the amount of training they would get. Instead, Winchester was tasked with creating a cartridge that could fire a 110 grain 30 caliber bullet at 2000 feet per second out of an 18 inch barrel. That cartridge became the 30 carbine. Its design was based off of a previous cartridge that Winchester had developed, the 32 Winchester self-loading cartridge. The 30 carbine has a reputation, fair or not, as being a bit of a wimpy cartridge. There are many anecdotes from service members of it lacking stopping power, particularly in close range encounters or when repelling a charging enemy. While I would never dispute a service member's personal anecdote related to the performance of an M1 on an enemy soldier, I will say that the numbers show that 30 carbine, when viewed with the proper context in mind, is not a wimpy cartridge. The first important factor to keep in mind is that the M1 carbine was intended to replace the M1911 pistol or as an alternative to the Thompson or M3 submachine guns, all of which fire the 45 ACP pistol cartridge. The 30 carbine fires a smaller bullet about half the weight of the 45, but it fires it over twice as fast. If we compare the cartridges by their energy when leaving the muzzle, there is no comparison, as the 30 carbine generates 882 foot-pounds and the 45 generates 405 foot-pounds. We're simplifying these numbers a little bit as we're using 45 data from a pistol barrel, but since that's what the M1 was primarily meant to replace, I think it's an apt comparison. Another way to look at it that really helped me contextualize the performance of the 30 carbine is that the M1 carbine has as much energy at 100 yards as a 357 Magnum revolver does at the muzzle. I don't know of anyone who would say the 357 Magnum is a wimpy pistol cartridge. Now, many of you are probably yelling at your screens that muzzle energy alone isn't a foolproof way to measure the effectiveness of a cartridge, and that other factors such as bullet weight, design, diameter, and engagement distance, among other things, all play an important role in performance. And you're right, I'd probably be yelling the same thing if I wasn't here in the studio. We're simplifying here, but the numbers still have some merit. Besides, the point of this all is, when evaluating the M1 carbine, it should be compared to the firearms and cartridge that it was replacing. And in most instances, it's going to be easier for a soldier with minimal training to be effective with the M1 carbine at distances between 50 and 300 yards than with a 1911 or any of the submachine guns. And at those distances, given proper shot placement, the 30 carbine has enough power to get the job done. Now, when comparing it to the M1 Garand and the 30-06 round, well, this photo should suffice in communicating to the uninitiated the vast difference in performance. But for the sake of consistency, I'll say that the 30-06 generates a whopping 2,656 foot-pounds of energy. So yeah, you can imagine how much more stopping power and long-range effectiveness the M1 Garand had over the M1 Carbine. But that's why combat infantrymen carried the Garand in the first place. Speaking of performance, let's take a look at the M1 Carbine's use throughout its 30-year history. In the process, we'll also discuss the three main variants of the Carbine, the M1A1, the M2, and the M3. In World War II, artillery units received the highest number of M1 carbines within a division. Artillery batteries were a valuable target for the enemy, and with the existence of airborne and raiding forces in World War II, it was necessary to arm artillery personnel with carbines for defense should the enemy break through or infiltrate the line and make contact. 
One table of organization and equipment that I've seen shows artillery battalions in 1943 and 1944 arming 80 to 95% of their soldiers with M1 carbines. An examination of engineer battalions shows the Army's understanding of the M1 carbine's place on the battlefield. As combat engineer battalions in 1944 armed only 10% of their soldiers with carbines, compared to 85% being armed with garands. By contrast, railway operation engineer battalions in the spring of 1942 armed 56% of their troops with carbines. In general, the closer the engineers were to the front, the more of them were armed with garands. One interesting thing to note is that in the table of organization for May of 1944, Marine divisions were issued nearly 11,000 carbines for a division of about 17,500 men, and with only about 5,500 garands authorized. That's 62% of Marines armed with M1 carbines. This speaks to the type of fighting the Marines were facing in the Pacific, where the carbine was handier in jungle fighting and where the 15-round capacity was helpful when repelling Japanese attacks at night. In fact, Legendary Marine Louis Chesty Puller felt that the carbine could replace the Thompson submachine gun and the 1911 in Marine units. Reading about the M1 in combat, however, yields mixed results. It seems to depend on the type of fighting, the conditions, and whether or not the user was comparing the carbine to the Garand or to the M1911 and submachine guns. One benefit that is often repeated was the ease of carrying ammunition with many soldiers praising the double mag pouch that could be affixed to the carbine stock, allowing them to carry three magazines in total on the firearm itself. Many praised the non-corrosive primers used in the ammunition, which allowed the carbine to go longer between cleanings without damage. The main criticism was that it lacked stopping power compared to the M1 Garand, or when compared to the M1911 at point-blank range. Lieutenant Colonel John George, a member of Merrill's Marauders, a Marine Special Operations Unit in the Pacific Theater, discusses the merits of the M1 carbine in his book, Shots Fired in Anger. Quote, the carbine turned out to be an ace weapon of the war, as far as I'm concerned. It was light and handy, powerful and reasonably accurate. If I had to make my own in hostile jungle, traveling with the lightest possible kit where I should be likely to encounter an enemy at any time, the carbine is the weapon I should choose. John Hooper, who served with the 115th Infantry Regiment, 29th Infantry Division, voiced his appreciation for the M1 while acknowledging its limitations in the book, U.S. Infantry Weapons in Combat. Quote, the carbine was more a personal protection weapon. They could very well have armed us with pistols. It wasn't an assaulting type weapon. I was able to do pretty well with it out to 300 yards back in training. That's what made me so attracted to the carbine, the ability to hit something at 300 yards. I considered it a reliable weapon. I never had any malfunctions with it whatsoever. I cleaned it periodically, although I didn't have to clean it every day. One group of soldiers that the carbine seemed especially suited for were the elite paratrooper units debuting in World War II. In fact, a paratrooper model was devised called the M1A1. The A1 variant had a folding metal wire stock and a wooden pistol grip attached. Either variant was easier to jump with than the longer M1 Garand or the heavier Thompson submachine gun, but with the stock folded, the M1A1 was incredibly compact and easy to jump with. There was even a jump holster that could hold it in this position during a jump, though not all units used them. The M2 variant was introduced near the end of the war alongside the new 30-round magazines we looked at earlier. The M2 could fire fully automatic at a rate of around 750 rounds per minute. Paratroopers and troops in the Pacific were two groups most interested in a full-auto version of the M1. By the end of the war, about 570,000 M2s were produced. Inland Manufacturing Division also created a conversion kit to give select fire capability to the standard M1 carbines. The M3 carbine was also introduced late in the war at the behest of the Chief of Engineers. It was designed to work with what was called the Sniper Scope, an early infrared scope with a 70-yard range. It's a rather unwieldy piece of equipment with its telescope assembly, power cable, power pack, and battery, 
It used a process to convert sub-visible light into the visible range, showing objects in various shades of green. A bit more cumbersome than today's night vision gear, but then again, the first computer was larger than a three-bedroom apartment here in Chicago. The entire getup weighed nearly 23 pounds, heavier than the Browning automatic rifle. It also featured a cone-shaped flash hider to preserve one's night vision while firing. I didn't find much on its use in combat. Other than that, there were fewer than 500 of them used during the invasion of Okinawa, but that they inflicted 30% of Japanese casualties during the first week of the campaign. In Korea, the carbine was mostly used in the M2 configuration. As in World War II, some soldiers preferred the shorter 15-round magazines as they could get closer to the ground when firing prone. Inexperienced combat troops often overused fully automatic fire at distances over 100 yards, resulting in wasted ammunition. With more experience, soldiers began using semi-auto fire at distances, saving full auto for close range, where it proved very effective at suppressing the enemy. The M1 and M2 continued to be used throughout the Cold War. In Vietnam, the M1 carbine was a popular weapon with troops of the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, as it suited the smaller stature of the average Vietnamese soldier better than the longer M1 Grand. As a result, U.S. advisors embedded with Arvin troops during the early part of the war often carried M1s as well. Nearly 800,000 M1 and M2 carbines were issued to the South Vietnamese. However, among U.S. troops, it was largely replaced by the M16 rifle starting in 1964 and was out of service by 1973. With so many M1s produced during World War II, millions were exported to U.S. allies during and after the war. Great Britain, France, South Korea, the Philippines are just some of the over 40 countries that have used or still currently use the M1 and M2 carbines in some capacity. It also saw use in Central and South America during the Cold War and was famously carried by Marxist revolutionary Che Guevara during the campaign to depose the Batista regime in Cuba in the late 1950s. The M1 carbine was a unique firearm in the U.S. arsenal. It's important historically as one of the first successful examples of the PDW concept and proved the value of the intermediary cartridge. Its success and the success of other similar intermediary cartridges and firearms signaled the coming trend of shorter, lighter weight firearms firing lighter weight bullets. We still had decades of full length battle rifles to come, but for every M14, FAL, or G3, there was an M16, AKM, or the even smaller carbine variants of those rifles. Thank you for submitting your questions and comments throughout the session. We will now take some time to address these. Thanks again for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed your opportunity to hear more about the M1 carbine. Now we're gonna go over to the audience for Q&A. Um, thanks to those of you who submitted your questions today. I'll try to answer as many as possible in this 10 minute Q&A session. Okay, so all right. one of the first questions we had was, uh, were the sights of the M1 carbine fixed or adjustable? So um, the particular model that, that we have in the collection has adjustable sights. However, the, uh, originally the M1s were um, built with uh, fixed sights. It was a very simple sort of L-shaped uh, aperture, aperture sights. You could flip between two different apertures, one that was zero to 100 meters and a second that was zero to 300 meters. Um, it did not have any sort of um, actual windage adjustments. Uh, Technically, you could probably tap the uh, tap the sight in the it's in the dovetail that it's sort of set within on the receiver. You could probably tap that to the left or right um, in case you had you know point of impact issues um, horizontally. However, my understanding is that those sights were also like staked in place, so it's not as simple as just tapping it, and it's probably not something that the average soldier would have been able to do. I know that today um, modern collectors will sometimes go through the efforts to do that if they happen to have one with the fixed sights. Um, but one of the one of the first um, improvements that they made was to change the sights to make them fully adjustable. Um, you know, with knobs that are easier to turn and and uh, so yeah, the majority of the carbines you're going to find um, have adjustable sights. Thank you for that question. Uh, 
Um, second question. Uh, you mentioned that soldiers liked that the M1 fired non-corrosive ammunition. What is uh, corrosive ammunition and why isn't it used in the M1 carbine? That's a very good question. Um, when we talk about corrosive ammunition, we're talking mostly about the primers. Um, in, you know, we're talking about centerfire rifle cartridges in which you know the main propellant charge is housed within the brass case, and there's a small little, um, essentially like a blasting cap almost. It's it's called a primer that sits in in at the back end of the bullet in the middle, and the firing pin strikes it, sets off that initial charge, which then burns the powder. So that's just for anyone who who is less familiar with how centerfire cartridges work. Um, now, uh, the issue is um, that the, the primers that most of the militaries of the world were using at that time uh, contained elements that could, could cause corrosion, and it was chiefly through, the, um, through different salts that were formed uh, when the cartridge was fired. Basically, the gas, the gas that you would get from the cartridge as it was being fired, anything that that gas touched would deposit the, these salts, these potentially corrosive salts. Um, you're talking um, potassium chloride or sodium chloride. Um, and the issue would be is when when moisture would then, you know, touch these salts, then it would form like an acid that would then eat away at the metal and it could do so very, very quickly. Um, I've heard stories of uh, firearms not being, you know, M1s not being cleaned, uh, you know, in, in the Pacific after a day or two and are already already starting to suffer uh, wear from that, those acids. Um, so why did militaries use corrosive ammunition then. It seems like a, a logistical nightmare. Well, um, for one, the, the the primers that were corrosive um, stored better and they lasted longer and they were more reliable. And, you know, corrosive ammunition doesn't inherently make, you know, wear a firearm out faster than non-corrosive provided that the shooter takes the appropriate steps to remove those salts after firing shortly after firing and so um, the these salts dissolve in water so um, the solution is, is really just to run water through um, you know the barrel and, and any and again any moving parts that the gas is touching so with the m1 uh, with the m1 carbine one of the major reasons why they uh, just went straight to non-corrosive is that the gas, the short stroke gas piston system, it just can't be cleaned easily. So um, if they had used corrosive ammunition, th those M1s would have been inoperable within days, probably, especially in the Pacific. So uh, nowadays, uh, you know, most militaries are not making corrosive ammunition anymore. Um, there's still plenty of surplus ammo out there that's corrosive. So, you know, anyone who, um, you know, is a collector of, of you know, antique firearms or, or you know vintage military firearms probably knows um, that that's something that you need to watch out for but in typical ammunition you're gonna you buy at your local stores is not going to be corrosive um let's see i have another question i think another question might have come in while i was talking uh, let's see uh, why was the top of the barrel covered in wood um, well, typically you, you see that with a lot of military firearms where the where the top is covered in wood. And, and this is essentially because um, it, to my knowledge, at least is, you know, when you're firing these 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 weapons, particularly if you're firing them repeatedly, the barrels get incredibly hot. And if you need to fire off enough rounds to really heat that up and then you need to move positions, well, the balance point on most firearms is going to be, you know, sort of near where that is. So you could potentially be wrapping your hand around the top of the barrel as you're getting ready to move and you're burning your hand. So most military firearms um, of that era will will have wood covering the top of the barrel as much as possible, um, certainly wherever you would potentially need to grab. Um, uh, this particular, uh, so someone asked who manufactured this M1. I apologize for not saying so in the program. Um, the This particular M1 was manufactured by Winchester. Um, okay, I have another question here. Let's see. Did any law enforcement agencies in the U.S. use surplus M1 carbines after the wars? Uh, the answer is yes. The M1 was quite popular um, as a patrol rifle in law enforcement vehicles um, up until about the late 90s when you started to see them replaced by M4, M16s, 
um, in, in those cars that that required them. Um, so there were some special units like the U New York Police Department's uh, stakeout squad and detectives with the East St. Louis Railroad Yards that made prolific use of M1 carbines. Um, in the book, The M1 Carbine by Leroy Thompson, uh, Jim Cirillo of the NYPD stakeout squad says um, that switching to hollow point ammunition uh, greatly improved the stopping power um, of the carbine and, and make it made it their most effective tool uh, when uh, involved in a, in a shootout. And unfortunately, that unit was involved in a lot of shootouts. Um, so that sort of addresses, you know, one of the major issues with the 30 carbine, you know, during World War II in, in Korea, you using the full metal jacket ammo. You know, we talked a little bit earlier about stopping power and, you know, I kind of made a joke that many people may be saying, hey, it's not just muzzle energy that's important. One of the one of the most important things is bullet design. Um, so uh, an expanding an expanding bullet like a hollow point is going to be a lot more effective. Apologies for that. Uh, my phone there uh, is going to be a lot more effective um, than uh, than just hard ball, you know, ball ammunition that's going to pass through a target without without expanding. Thank you for tuning in this afternoon. If you enjoyed this program and are looking for more engaging content, please be sure to visit our website at www.pritzkermilitary.org for a list of free videos on a host of thought-provoking topics. If you're not a member of the museum and library already, please consider becoming one today. Our membership community is vital to supporting the activities that help fulfill our mission and vision. Thank you again for joining us today and please watch for future programming.